Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing word feast right here on Facebook or YouTube, whichever social media platform you're watching from today. Abel Damina is my name. There is a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's what this broadcast is all about today. So get ready to unlearn so you can relearn the truths concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me also advise you in the course of teaching, certain questions may arise. Just be patient, pay attention, and listen carefully. Because scriptures will interpret scriptures as you patiently follow the teaching of God's word. You know, the Bible tells us that the time shall come when people shall not endure sound doctrine. So sound doctrine is to be endured. So endure. You know, the word of God also tells us that with meekness, you receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul with meekness. So there's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So as the teaching of God's word begins to come, get your notebook, get your pen, follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in this series because we take time to holistically look at subject matters in the light of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage those of you that are connecting for the first time today, get ready to keep following. We are right here on Facebook and YouTube every day. We're here at 12 noon, GMT plus one. We're here at 6 p.m. We're here at 10 p.m. every day. You don't want to miss any of them because all of these times that I've mentioned, they are designed to equip you with sound knowledge of Jesus Christ. In the midst of a world of uncertainties, with all kinds of messages of fear going all over, you need to stock up, you need to feed yourself with the truth of the gospel so you're rooted and grounded and not moved to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Two more things to introduce to you today. If you are in a city where there is no church, Christ-centered church, where they teach the message of Christ, it is not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says God has set the solitary in families. God wants you to be a part of a local assembly, a gathering of believers where you can pray together, learn the word of God together, and effectively serve one another and go out to the world and bring the gospel of Christ. If you want to join any of our campuses around the world today, or you want to start one in your own locality and be the lighthouse in that community, all you need to do is shoot me a mail today telling me about your desire to either be a part of a campus or to start one with your location and your phone number. We will get in touch with you and help you either begin one or identify with an existing one. The last thing is I have a lot of books like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you answer your questions and bring you clarity of explanation of the Word of God. And if you want to order for any or all of the books today, all you need to do again is shoot a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. I'm excited, very excited. Invite a friend, tag somebody, create a watch party, but today is going to be a powerful time of teaching you the Word of His grace. Fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into a service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy view. John chapter 4, verse number 21. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. The moment Jesus made this statement, he abolished the relevance of the temple. The moment he made this statement, he rendered the temple irrelevant. Now, remember, all of these Jewish people, every year, they go to the temple in Jerusalem. All the time, they go to the temple every year, all through the years. And Jesus just casually walks to this woman at the well and renders the temple irrelevant. He said, the hour coming now is, that's beginning from now. True worshippers won't go to Jerusalem. They won't go to the temple. True worship is not in a location. True worship is in the heart of a regenerated believer. And while the woman was speaking God to Jesus, Jesus was speaking Father to her. He took her from God to Father. 
he took her from God as creator to relationship. He, he began to deal with a lot of things. He took her from natural well and he told her the water that shall give you shall be a well in you springing up to everlasting life. He took her from just ordinary discussion of water and began to deal with spiritual matters which were more important. And then we began to see a number of things that the word was preached to the Jews, you know, as well as unto us. But the one that was preached to them they didn't benefit them because they didn't mix it with faith. They were destroyed because of unbelief. They were overthrown because of unbelief. And then we began to see that the law was not God's mind for the people. The law was given in response to the condition of their hearts. The plan of God from the beginning of time was not a law. The plan of God from the beginning of time was Christ. But when Moses saw that if he gave Christ to Israel, they would not accept Christ. He kept Christ to himself and gave them the law. In fact, Moses said to them, I set before you life and death. What is life and death? Life is the law of the spirit of life in Christ. He gave them Christ. Death is the law of sin and death. He gave them the law. The people desired the law to the life of God. In fact, God said to them in Exodus chapter 19, all of you come up to the mount. I want to talk to you because I want all of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. And they said to Moses, go, we don't want God. Let God talk to you. You talk to us. They told God, we don't want to talk to God. Let God talk to you, Moses. You talk to us. People like intermediaries. People don't want to relate with God directly. They want one man of God somewhere, one so-called prophet somewhere that will look at the crystal ball for them and tell them what God is saying. They said, no, Moses, we don't want to talk to God. You talk to God, and when you hear from God, you come and tell us. That's not God's plan for man. It has never been. God never wanted anybody to go to any physical location to worship him. He wanted people to worship him as a relationship in spirit and in truth. And somebody says, so why do we gather today in this place to worship? Because this is where we get teaching. This is where we get instruction. If you remember, I've told you before, that the essence of coming to church is not entertainment. It's to be taught. In Ephesians chapter 4, he that descended, he see that ascended. When he ascended up on high, he gave gifts to men. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. The mission of the church is to perfect you, to mature you, to teach you the word, so that you in turn can do the work of ministry where you are. The work of ministry is not done inside the church. The work of ministry is done in your office. It's done in your place of work. If you're a medical doctor, when you are testing patients, that's where you do the work of ministry. You share Christ, you minister to them. If you're a lawyer, when people come to talk about their cases, that's your pulpit. My job here is to coach everybody here to go out where you do your business, where you do your work becomes your pulpit. That's where you do the work of ministry. The work of ministry is not done in church. The church is a place to equip the saints. We equip you here so that on Monday you do work of ministry. If you're a teacher on that blackboard, before you finish teaching, the remaining five minutes you have, you drop a seed of the gospel. Whatever profession. Why? Because that's your field. That's your pulpit. We train you here. You go out there on your pulpit. You do the work of ministry. If you're a radio presenter, in the midst of your presentation, you do the work of ministry. If you're a TV presenter, in the midst of your presentation, you do your work of ministry. If you're a policeman, when you arrest criminals, you do your work of ministry. Everybody here is supposed to do the work of ministry out where they do their business, where they do their jobs. The church is a training ground where we train you so you can confront the challenges out there. So we don't have time for entertainment. You don't equip people by entertaining them. Equipping people is a very serious job. It's not comedy. It's serious because when the challenges of life confront you, they are not going to smile for you. When challenges of life confront you, they are not going to pamper you. So that is why when we teach you the word, we don't play with it because we are equipping you to confront life. When sickness faces you, sickness doesn't smile. We are equipping you to dissolve sickness, disease, and confront financial challenges, challenges of life, storms of life, situations of life, difficulties out there, satanic setups, the wickedness of men, situations and circumstances. All of that are the things you confront day to day in your daily life. You come to church for the one, two hours we have from you. Our job is to equip you with what you need to live a victorious life out there. So the essence of church is to equip you, not to entertain you. To equip you to do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence of church. 
That's why we gather like this. It's not as if you couldn't have worshipped at home. But God put the church, the local assembly in place for you to be equipped. And then number two, for you to be held accountable. So somebody can hold you accountable. Somebody can hold you accountable. When you're not behaving like you ought to behave, somebody can say, hey, you're not doing it right. When you're not operating the way you ought to operate, somebody can tell you, stop, stop, stop. What you're doing is not going to work for you. That's the mission of the church. So that somebody can hold you accountable. That's why the Bible says you should obey them that have the rule over you because they will give account of you to God so that when they give account of you, they will do it with joy and not with grief. For that is not profitable for you. So the church is a place where we hold you accountable after equipping you to do the work of ministry. Now, that's very important. So we began to deal with the fact that God's plan for man has never been the law. The law was given in response to the condition of men's heart. Jesus said to the Jews, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, it was in response to the condition of your heart that he gave you the law. In the beginning, there was no law. It was not so. Man requested for the law. Man demanded for the law. That was not God's plan for man. That wasn't God's plan for man. What was God's plan for man? A kingdom of priests. A people that will know him. And that's why when Jesus died, he rusticated the temple worship. And now he has made all of us kings and priests unto our God royal priesthood so every one of us here is a priest every one of us here is a king unto our god that means you don't need an intermediary to talk to god for you you can talk to god directly Kabaya. nobody has more access than you we all have equal access to the father thank you lord hebrews chapter 1 verse number 1 God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we said God is seen in the Son. Christ is the explanation of all things. If you miss Jesus, you miss God. Jesus is not God's errand boy. Jesus is not number two God. Jesus is God who became a man to explain and reveal God to man in human form. Nobody else can explain God to you like God himself. Nobody else. So Jesus became a man to reveal God to man. So Jesus, therefore, is the express image of God. He has spoken to us by his son, the heir, the owner of all things. The owner of all things. J.B. Phillips' translation calls Jesus the lawful owner of all things. By whom also he made the world. Meaning, Jesus made the walls. By whom also he made the wall. When you were reading in Genesis 1, God said, let there be light. That was Jesus. Jesus is God. By whom also he made the walls. Appointed him the lawful owner of everything. He owns everything. So Jesus is God, meaning Jesus is God who became a man to explain God to man. So man is free from assumptions and from superstition. Away with the superstition. If God is still mysterious to you, it means you don't believe the gospel. There is no more mysteriousness about God. God has been revealed to man expressly in the person of Christ. That's not like saying, we don't know the mind of God. We don't know what God is thinking. We know what God is thinking in Christ. We know the mind of God in Christ. We know what God will do in Christ. And we know what God will not do in Christ. Christ 
reveals God to man. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So we don't group Jesus with the prophets. Jesus is God explained by God. Now that Colossians 1.15, take note of the words there. Who is the image of the invisible God? There are two opposites in those words. You can't have image and invisible at the same time. Image, invisible don't work. They are opposites. Which means God is invisible. So he decided to appear visible in an image called Jesus. The image of the invisible God. Meaning Christ gives face to God. Meaning Jesus is the face of God. When you see Jesus, you have seen God. The image of the invisible God. The word invisible is the Greek word eratos. A-O-R-A-T-O-S. Eratos. One you cannot see. Romans 1.20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Colossians 1.16 For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Erotos. First Timothy 1.17 Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He calls God invisible. But he calls Jesus the image of the invisible. Jesus, the image. The word image is a Greek word, e-i-k-o-i-n. E -I -K -O -I -N. If something is invisible, it can't have an image. But Jesus is the image of the invisible. Meaning, God is no more invisible. Meaning, God is no more invisible. Why? He has been revealed in Christ. God is visible in the person of Jesus. No wonder Jesus will say, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Hallelujah. John 1 29. Behold, the Lamb of God, not the Lamb for God. He's not the Lamb for God. He's the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Not the Lamb for God. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. That's why in Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. And one of the elders said unto him, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. This elder is not well taught. This elder calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion is a negative word. Jesus is not the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is what an elder said. This is what one of the elders said. He called him the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. This guy is a Jew. From all indications. This elder is a Jewish man. Because look at, it's Jewish people that speak like that. But Jesus is not a liar. Liar and a lamb seated on the throne. He's not a liar. A lion is a negative word. Second Timothy 4.17. Look at the way the Bible describes lion here. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. A lion is something you run away from. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Hebrews 11.33 Top the mouth of lions. First Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Nothing positive about a lion. Revelation 4.7 
and the first beast was a lion and the second beast like a calf and the third beast had a face as a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle nothing positive about a lion even revelation 9 8 revelation 9 17 revelation 10 3 and revelation 13 2 always lion in the bible is used to describe an enemy so that elder who called jesus lion he used that word ignorantly in the book of revelation the consistency in describing jesus is a lamp 29 times in revelation jesus is called a lamb only one time he's called a lion by that elder so that elder was ignorant jesus is not a lion jesus is a lamb that's why i read all the other references for you to see the usage of the word lion in the epistles is for negative things he was worshiping god ignorantly second guessing he was worshiping god based on rumor he was worshiping god based on superstition he did not have a first hand understanding of god and somebody said but this man was speaking from a vision yeah, haven't you seen people that had vision that they didn't understand what the vision was? Was Peter not in a vision when he saw four-footed animals and God said, eat, he said, it's unclean, I cannot eat it. That you are ignorant doesn't mean in a vision you will have knowledge. The ignorance you have here, even in a vision, it will show. That's why when people say they died and went to heaven and came back and saw God, I know they are suffering from malaria at its highest level. You went to heaven, all you saw is water garden. Why don't you go to plaza? You didn't go anywhere. The only people that have gone to heaven from the Bible, when they came back, they couldn't talk. There's nothing. How can you? Where do you start explaining? The glories of heaven are beyond English language. They are beyond any language mortal man can speak. That's why God gave us tongues. Because there are times you want to enter some realms of communication, English fails. When English fails, you switch to tongues. So if here to even communicate with God, English fails you. Is it when you get to heaven or when you see into the glories of heaven that you have English to even be explaining it in a book? Chapter 1, what I saw. Chapter 2, what I did. Chapter 3, what he said to me chapter 4 how i came back huh. well done clap for yourself <laughs> that in a vision doesn't mean everything is perfect that's why even a vision has to be interpreted in the light of christ there's another guy that was in a vision but couldn't even understand what he was seeing ananias ananias in the bible so vision doesn't mean it is authentic. That an elder called Jesus a lion doesn't mean it is correct. We have to look at it doctrinally. A vision is not for doctrine. That's why visions are subjected to doctrine. And if they don't fit into doctrine, we throw them away. So Jesus is a lamb. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. So God's character is the character of a lamb, not a lion. Revelation 6.16 6, calls it the wrath of the lamb. The wrath of the lamb. What is the wrath of the lamb? It's a figure of speech. It means the sacrifice of the lamb. The sacrifice. The death of the lamb. The sacrifice of Christ is called the wrath of the lamb. God is revealed in Christ and Christ is a lamb meaning God is a lamb again is Jesus God is Jesus God does Jesus explain God to us so how does Jesus explain God's character to us a lamb Paul says the weakness of God he calls it the weakness of God because it's actually weakness it's actually weakness how can you say you are God and the only way you will save people is by you becoming a man and dying the death of a man to save people? That is weakness. That is weakness. God is a lamb. Lions are destructive. 
if God was a lion, he won't come down and die. He would destroy everything. The weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God, it is foolish. It is foolish that God wants to save you. The only way to save you is to come down and be like you and take your offense and suffer for your offense to save you. That's weakness. That's God's character. He's a lamb. He's a lamb. He's not a liar. Thank you, Lord. He's a lamb. He's not a liar. Hallelujah. All religions on earth, they boast of a destructive God. All of them. Except Christianity. We boast of a God of love. We boast of a God of love. We boast of a God who loves man. We boast of a God who out of his love for man became a man to die on behalf of man. We boast of a God who walked the face of the earth and was messed around by men and yet said nothing. We boast of a God who controls the whole world yet accepted to stay in the womb of a fragile girl called Mary. And he stayed there for nine months and went through what Mary went through with her. Maybe she even had malaria, if there was malaria in her time. Maybe she even had fever. Maybe she even ran temperature, but she was still in that womb. Maybe she even went through all the different hormonal conditions that a pregnant woman goes through. Of course, she has to go through because it's normal pregnancy. And yet, he was humble in that womb. That's the God we serve. He's a lamb. His character is that of a lamb. Walk the face of this earth. People slapped him. He didn't paralyze their hand. Oh, you don't know? They slapped God. People slapped God. Who is Jesus? Exactly. Did they slap Jesus? They slapped God. He didn't slap back. If it was you, you would have demonstrated some muscle, you know. As the hand is going up, you will make the hand to keep going. The hand will just keep going. You will tell the person, what are you trying to do? The hand will keep going. It will go till it will go round. It will come again. You will tell him, stay there for three weeks. Let people know that you attempted God. But he walked the face of the earth. They slapped him. He said nothing. The Bible said they reviled him, but he reviled not. That's your God. That's the God you serve. That's your father. Hallelujah. That's the character of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. And without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in your spirit. Seen of angels for the first time. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. Great is the mystery. Whose being. That's a Greek word. Whose being. Great is the mystery. God is manifest. Another opposite. You can't say mystery. And say manifest. <laughs> Two op another opposite. Great is the mystery. So meaning. When he manifested. It's no more a mystery. So the manifestation of Christ demystifies God. The manifestation of Christ demystifies God. So to know God, you look into Christ. When you see into Christ, you see God. To know God, I know Christ. Outside Christ, there's no other place to know God. The Old Testament people kept singing, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, because they had no other way of imagining how to know God. So they had to be looking for God in stars and thunders. But today, we know God in Christ. Hallelujah. God became flesh, mystery demystified. So assumptions, away. Superstition, Go. We see God where? In Christ. Huh. We see God in Christ. 
People like Elijah. You know, some of you, Elijah used to be your hero. And there are some people, Elijah is still their hero. But Elijah didn't even know God. Elijah's knowledge of God was very myopic. Very, very myopic. No wonder he was busy calling fire down to clear people out. He knew God in superstitious realm. He really didn't know God. You know, one time Elijah was looking for God. He said the thunder blasted. And he thought God was there. When he went, God was not in the thunder. There was, even Elijah didn't know God. It was trial and error. It was trial and error. Then after a while he said, while I was still looking for God, in a still small voice. So that means he was not sure. And if God didn't continue manifesting things, he would have said that thunder was God. Are you understanding? Meaning he doesn't know God. How many of you remember in the book of John, certain Greeks came and they said, we will see Jesus. Then thunder blasted. Then they said, it thundered. That thunder was not thunder. It was God speaking audibly. But because they don't know God, they concluded that God's voice is thunder. When you don't know God, when you hear God's voice, you will say it's earthquake. Because in your mind, when God speaks, the whole earth should tremble. Because you're thinking of a lion. But he's a lamb. And look at Elijah with superstition. He now said to God, I am the only one left. No other person. God says, shut your mouth. Even in your village, there are 7,000 that have not bowed to bow. How can you be the only one? How can you be the only one? Shut your mouth. Hallelujah. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I even, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Next verse. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains. And he broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. All of those violent expressions. God was not in it. Then later on, God will reveal himself in a still small voice. Hallelujah. Your God is a lamb. Your God is a lamb. The only commentary on Elijah in the New Testament. The only time Elijah is quoted... With all of his exploits, is two times. Only two times somebody made reference to Elijah. Number one was uh, Paul, and number two was James. James says, Elias was a man of like passion, but he prayed earnestly that it may not rain. The reference made of Elijah in the epistle is not fire coming down, it's even rain. And then, of course, brother Paul in Romans. In just one verse, he just mentioned Elijah in passing. Praise God. We are the climax of this thing. We know God in Christ. Touch your neighbor and say, I know God in Christ. Touch your neighbor and say, Christ reveals God to me. Hallelujah. In John chapter 5 verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. Next verse. And the Father himself which has sent me had borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. And you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent him you believe not. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. Let me ask you a very clear question and I want to have a very powerful answer. Can man see God can man see God? Can sinners see God? Can sinners see God? Did sinners see Jesus? Did they touch Jesus? Who is Jesus? Man has seen God. Sinners 
have seen God and they still see God. In the four Gospels, stop living superstitiously. Christ reveals God. He is the image of the invisible. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 9. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Verse 10. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Let me ask you a question. Did God ask for offering for sin? Why? Because he himself is the offering. He doesn't ask you for offering for your sin. He gave himself as an offering for your sin. And he paid for it eternally. Thank you Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away what? That word take away is the Greek word A-N-A-I-R-E-O. It means to kill it. To end the law of sin consciousness. He took away the old to establish the new. He killed the old. He put an end to the old, which is sin consciousness. Hebrews 4 to, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached to them did not profit them. They didn't mix faith. They didn't believe the gospel. They didn't accept the lamb. They didn't accept the message of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 18, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. That's Mount Sinai. That's not the mount. 22, you are come unto Mount Zion. 24, you are come unto Jesus, the mediator of the New Testament. 25, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse him that speak on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he had promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Which things are shaken? The law. The law and all the practices. What are the things that are not shaken? The New Testament. The finished work of Christ. The finished work of Christ. Why? The law was a shadow. So because the law was a shadow, it cannot stand the test of time. But the finished work of Christ is a substance. We are for, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. We are by, we may serve God acceptably with reverence. For our God is a consuming fire. I hear people quote it all the time. I know that God is a God of love. I know when you meet religious people, they will confront you with that. I know that God is a God of love. But at the same time, the Bible says, there's a consuming fire. That consuming fire was a fire that consumed our sins on the cross when Jesus died. And that consumption has been over with and is done with. The only next time we will see that fire is hell for those who reject Christ. God is not consuming anybody. Somebody asked, but, but the Bible says God is a consuming fire. So I asked the person, how has he consumed you? How? You can't tell me you've not made mistakes. You can't tell me you've not committed sin. You can't tell me you've not been wrong since you got born again. How has he consumed you? And God is not selective in his operation. If he's a consuming fire, anybody that makes mistake, he will wipe all of us out. He's a God of justice. So, and if nobody has been consumed, it means that consuming fire has to be explained. So the consuming fire there is not for today. It's what he has done in Christ. Which if you reject, then you will go and face the actual fire in hell by yourself. Christ has been consumed on our behalf. God poured on Jesus his wrath, his anger, his judgment, his fire. He poured his fury on Christ. Why? God does not overlook sin. What does he do? He punishes sin. How does he punish it? On himself. Thank you, Lord. That's the message of the grace of God. Stop building your Christianity on people's testimonies. 
Stop building your life on what your mother told you, what somebody told you, what that man of God said. But one man of God told me that when you pray in the midnight, you will be having answer in the morning. Stop building your life on what man of God said. That's why God made sure all of us have a copy of the Bible. Everybody has a copy. Stop building your life on what somebody said when you have the document in your hand. Search the scripture for yourself. Know God for yourself. And how do you know God? Where? In Christ. Acts 17, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. The word superstitious is the Greek word T-I-E-S-I-D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S-T-R-O-S. It means to be in dread of an unseen being. Superstition means to be in dread of an unseen being. You know those cathedrals where you go to before? Everybody's in dread of an unseen being. In awe of a being we do not see. You know what I'm talking about? It's superstition. Being in dread, in awe of an unseen being. That's the meaning of the word superstitious in that context. Someone you cannot see, but you are afraid of. And that's the way many people worship God. Since they can't see God, they're afraid of him. You are too superstitious. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. You are in awe and you are in dread of an unseen being. God is mysterious. Very mysterious. You can never know his ways. His ways are past finding out. So when it is beyond us, we just give thanks. Who are we to question God? We cannot question God. Hmm? Which God? The lion or the lamb? We cannot question God. Oh, you can question my God and he will supply you answers. You can ask him. He's, he doesn't want you to be afraid of him. Away with fear. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption. We are bad. You cry. Let me tell you, the more you know God, the farther away you are from fear. The more you know God, the farther away you are from fear. If you are still afraid of God, you don't know him. See, the more you know somebody, the more fear goes. The more you know somebody, the more fear goes. Mysterious God. We can't question. No, no. He said, come close, come close. Come, let us reason. Come, let us reason. When you and somebody reason, don't you ask question? Talk to me, power city. When you and somebody reason, don't you ask question? Exactly. You come in prayer say, Father, wait, wait. Father, 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 calm down, calm down. Calm down. I don't understand why this is like this. Then the Holy Spirit will now start taking your mind. Through scriptures. As you are quietly meditating, the Spirit of God will begin to put light on the scriptures you have known before. And in the midst of the light, He will now focus on the main scripture that supplies the answer. Bam! That question is answered by God in His Word. If He finds out your study is weak, you don't have a good study culture, He will supernaturally direct your steps to service. And as you are seated and I come to teach, he will drop an utterance in my mouth. And suddenly, I will give you the answer. Bam! And that is not my topic. But as I was teaching, because of you, I went out of my message and dropped it, then came back to my message. Sometimes I will even say, what even took me there? Somebody who asked God a question, God had to answer his question somehow, somehow. Why? Because he wants to answer your questions. He doesn't want you to serve him in darkness. He wants you to serve him where? 
in the light. When we walk in the light, even as he is in the light, we have fellowship. God wants you to ask him questions. He wants you to learn of him. He wants you to be so intimate with him. He wants you to know him. They that know their God. He wants you to know him. There's no dread about God. He said, I beheld your devotions. Look at devotions. Next verse 23. I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. The word devotions is the Greek word sevasma. S-E-V-A-S-M-A. Sevasma. It's from the root word S-E-V-A-Z-O-B-O-M-I. Devotions means you are afraid. I beheld your devotions. I beheld your devotions. You are afraid. You are in awe. Okay? And on the altar where you are so afraid and in awe, there's an inscription to the unknown God. The word unknown is the Greek word agnestos. A-G-N-E-S-T-O-S. It means someone is afraid of God and because of that he's not worshipping right. He's so afraid. Afraid. He can't feel free. He can't serve with confidence. He can't serve with boldness. Kayabada. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, and dwelleth not in temples, made with hands. He said all those temples, God never lived in it for once. He said all those temples they built, God has never been in any of those temples for one. Because God does not dwell in temples that are built by men. He has rendered all their worship useless. The other day I was showing you that they built a holy of holies and gave an impression that God was, God was never in those holy of holies. If the first was good, why the need for the second? It was just a shadow. It was just a shadow. It was a figure. It was a symbol. Neither is worship with men's hands. As though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. God giveth everything. He's a giver and not a taker. He giveth life. He giveth breath. He giveth everything to man. Hallelujah. He is Abba. He is Father. The word Father is the Greek word Pata. Someone who is responsible for you. Someone who is responsible for you. The worship of God means he doesn't need anything from me. He doesn't need anything from me. That's the worship of God. Pata. Source. Verse 26. And I've made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and are determined the times before appointed and the bonds of their habitation. Next verse. That they should seek the Lord, take note of the word, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The word feel after him, feel, is the Greek word seller flow. P-S-E-L-A-P-H-L-O. Someone you can touch. God made himself touchable. No distance. God is not far. God is close. Stop telling people about a God that cannot be seen. Tell people about a God that is touchable. He's very close. Even a sinner can touch him. A nobody can touch him. If they may feel after him. If they may touch him. No distance. Hallelujah. He's not far from anyone. No, no distance. God is so near. People can reach him. People can touch him. He's revealed in Christ. Hallelujah. Seeing that he does not need anything from anybody. He doesn't need anything. That's why I said, you don't give to be blessed. You give because you are blessed. He doesn't need anything. He needs nothing. Nothing. There's nothing you can give him. He does not need you to survive. He said, if I wanted a house, I would not come to you. If I want food, I will not ask you. The God we are talking about does not wait for your offering before he blesses you. 
He blesses you so that you can have to give for the advancement of his work. He gives to you so you can have to give for the advancement of his work. He doesn't need anything from anyone. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you not happy that the God you serve, you don't have to sustain him? Are you not happy that your God, you don't have to sustain him? You know, some people's God is in their pockets. And they are the ones that protect him. You can't come close. They will fight you because they are protecting their God. But my own God is not in my pocket. He's in my heart. And at the same time, he is outside me protecting me. Mashotaladabaha. Somebody stand on your feet and shout, I see God in Christ. Don't your neighbor say, my God is revealed in a person called Christ. When I see Christ in Christ, I see God. I thought I would hear your amen. Don't your neighbor say, neighbor, away with superstition. Away with superstition. We can see God. We can talk to God. We can ask him questions. Tell your neighbor, the more you know God, the further away you are from fear. Do you know that in the New Testament, there is no teaching of the epistles that ask you to fear God? None. You will never find any teaching from Acts to Revelation where you are asked to fear God. You won't find one. You won't find one. Anybody you fear, you cannot relate with. Every time you come close to your father, he will beat you. You do something, he will beat you. Every time you come close, he will start asking you, have you eaten? You didn't eat today. What did I tell you last time? Bam! The next time you see him, you won't go close. If he call you, you will pretend you didn't hear it. Because why will I be going and be beating all the time? What kind of father is this? What kind of father? From the age of 14, you start learning how to leave a house. From 15, you start thinking of owning an independent life. Because that house, as far as you're concerned, is a, is a cruel house. Is it true? Yeah. God is not a terrorist. No. So you don't have to come to God with fear. And trembling. In case you're coming on a bad day when God just woke up from a bad dream. And he wants to start by slapping somebody. And you're the victim. No. I have news for you. God has never had a bad day. Every time you see him, he's having a good time. And I have news for you. The last time I checked, he's not angry with you. He loves you from the bottom of his heart. And I have news for you. His thoughts concerning you are not evil, but good to give you a future and a hope. If you're the one I'm talking about, let your enemy taller than your neighbor. So you can come boldly. How do you come? To the throne of grace. Boldly. No fear. No fear. You have not received the spirit of bondage. But the spirit of. Whereby. You know why they had the spirit of bondage to fear? They didn't know God. So since they didn't know God. They were afraid of a being they didn't know. But when we see Christ. We know there's nothing to be afraid of. When you look at Jesus. How he operated. Even when people misbehave, he looked for how to help them. Even when people were not right, he looked for how to fix them. When you see God in Christ, it gives you boldness towards God. I prophesy over the first 1,000 of you whose hands will be lifted with a shout of a loud amen. You will never be stranded in life. The grace of God abound towards you. You will always have sufficiency in all things. I decree throughout the course of this year, you will swim in favor. You will experience the abundance of grace. What God has done for you in Christ, you will enjoy the fullness of it. You are blessed beyond the course. You are lifted, you will never come down. I decree throughout this year, you will harvest opportunities. You will harvest opportunities. You will harvest opportunities. Favor is working for you. Closed doors have opened for you. I decree throughout this year, God will bring meaningful relationships into your life. God will bring meaningful relationships into your life. Any relationship around you that is a minus, I divorce you from that relationship. I dismantle that relationship. I command situations to make it difficult for you to exist in that relationship. In the name of Jesus, this year will be a year of additions for you. A year of increase for you. A year of enlargement for you. 
This year, you will increase in the knowledge of Christ. This year, you will make plenty money. This year, we will evangelize more than ever before. In the name of Jesus, receive grace to make money. I say receive grace to make money. Who is going to make money this year? I say receive grace to make money. Receive grace for industry. Receive grace for manufacturing. Receive grace for trading. Receive grace for buying and selling. Receive grace for jobs. Receive grace for contracts. Kayata, Kayata, Kayata. Wherever there is an opportunity, see the opportunity. Seize the opportunity. If your amen is louder, even people you are not looking for, they will look for you and give you opportunities. This year, people will invest into your business. People will invest into your career. People will invest into the work of your hands. I decree that your income is enlarged. Your capital is enlarged. Your capital is enlarged. Your capital is enlarged. Your capital is enlarged. I call the things that are not as though they are. Your capital is enlarged. Your business expands. I see more branches. In the name of Jesus. I decree that throughout this year, sickness will be far from your house. Far from your territory. Far from your home. The devil and his agents are dismantled. Their arrows will not see you. You are delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. You are delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. You are delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every human agenda against you is dismantled. The more they gather, the more they get confused. I decree by the finished work of Christ, they shall surely gather, but for your sake they scatter. By the finished work of Christ, reign in life. You will win from every direction. In the name of Jesus. It is done. It is done. It is done. Can I hear that amen on a note of finality? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. What a time of learning. A time of unlearning and a time of relearning the word of his grace. Brother Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. The word has come with clarity. Please don't go away. If there's anything that was wrong in your life, the word of God has gone forth to fix it. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke pain. I rebuke confusion. I rebuke discomfort. Now, receive healing. Receive a miracle where you need one today. In the name of Jesus, receive a miracle. I clear every confusion out of your life. We rebuke fear. And the hold of darkness is broken in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Now, listen very carefully. I want to encourage you. I have a lot of books, like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you, answer your questions, and bring you clarity of explanation of the Word of God. Shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. You can order them from our office, either the books, the CDs, or the DVDs, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Shoot us a mail today with your orders, and we will ensure that we reach out to you today. If you're in a city where there's no church, where the message of Christ like this is preached or taught, that is already an opportunity for you to serve Jesus by getting involved with ministry. This is the way it works. All you need to do is shoot us a mail. We will take time and equip you and prepare you to begin an extension of our church ministry called a campus where other believers in your locality can assemble with you in your own venue and learn together with you the message, pray with you, and together all of you can reach out to more people with the truth of the gospel. Or you're in a place where you desire to just belong to the campus, shoot us a mail with your location today. We'll connect you to the nearest campus to where you are of our ministry. It always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Always a joy to bring you clarity, to equip you, to build you up in the knowledge of Christ. I'm excited today. Looking forward to hearing from every one of you today. And don't forget to stay tuned for the next broadcast that comes up in a few hours from now. Share with people about what God is doing on this platform. 
And until we connect with you again, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Amen.